All right, hello everybody and welcome to the presentation, The Ethics of Our Art, Research Ethics and the Games User Experience. My name is Ann Johnson and I am the director of the Institutional Review Board and the Human Research Protection Program at the University of Utah. And what I do in my everyday life is make sure that human beings who are in research are protected, both their safety and their rights. Um, and I'll have my colleague Lisa introduce herself as well. Hi, I'm Lisa Rigtrip. I am an operations manager and webmaster at the University of Utah IRB. I've been there for about 15 years and I'm also in my free time, enjoy gaming. So this, uh, this topic combines my professional life and my personal life in kind of an interesting way. So I'm excited to talk about it today. Awesome. And I'm excited to get to work with Lisa and learn more about gaming and uh, how ethics applies to it. So our goal today with this presentation and in this session is really to explore how ethical principles apply to the game user research community. And so we're going to propose a few key ethical principles today, three of them, and give you some examples of how these principles apply to a variety of situations in, in our lives or that we're experiencing, um, and then really focus in on applying these to some experiences that the games user research community has already had, the gaming community has had, um, and propose some actions for you or some, some things to think about if you are doing games user research um, and are involving members of the gaming community and public to test games and to do this kind of research, whether it's in the academic setting or just in the product testing setting. So that is our goal today. So I wanted to start out by just giving a sense of what ethics is and, and why we care. So I want to start out with this idea of common morality. So this idea in, very basically is that many of us in society and particularly societies that interact with one another and are alike, we ascribe to the idea that there is a common morality, that we sh have a shared or standard um, for what human conduct should be. Um, and these are things like in our country, don't steal. That's in many countries. That's, that's a, a standard of human conduct. Um, but sometimes um, there are specifics of, for human conduct, depending on the profession that you work in, the institution that you work at, um, the religion you may practice, or um, depending on the government um, within the country that oversees you, there can be different standards or different ways to apply um, our morality. That means that we have, we come into conflict with the way we think human conduct should go based on these principles of morality. So even within the same society, my version of what stealing is could be different from your version of what stealing is. You know, my version of stealing could be, well, as long as you're not walking out with product from a store, you're fine. Your version of stealing could be, well, you're using someone else's uh, Netflix password. That is stealing. Um, so we we debate these ways of applying our common morality. So in that sense, we as humans have developed policies, laws, regulations, um, different practices, guidelines that we have put into place to kind of help standardize the way we consider how we behave. So there are laws in our countries that tell us if you do a certain thing a certain way, that is against the law, but if you do it in a different way, it's not. So we're gonna talk about a couple of different um, ideas um, and laws and practices that are going on in the United States um, that kind of help to illustrate this. But before we move on to those examples, I want to now introduce you to these three core ethical principles that I mentioned in the beginning that I want to use today to kind of understand how we can apply different principles in, in our morality and how they work. So the first one is called respect for persons. So the idea of this is that we value as a principle, the ability to choose and that we should have autonomy as human beings to choose and make choices about what affects us, what we want to do, et cetera. But the idea isn't just being able to make choices, but being able to make choices based on high quality information. And you'll hear words such as consent and informed consent. Um, these ideas wrap into respect for persons. And so 
Um, we want to make sure that we as human beings can make good decisions for ourselves based on good information. The second principle is beneficence. And you'll recognize this idea of reducing harm and maximizing benefit. Um, in the medical profession, you hear the words do no harm. That is a principle of beneficence, the idea that we want harms low and benefits high if we can get them there, right? Sometimes in given situations, you can't get that balance um, into an ideal space, but we try and we have the ideal that we want to do that. The third principle is justice. And this is one that we as societies tend to be pretty familiar with because of democracy and governments, um, social justice movements and things of that nature, equality and fairness. So um, this does embody the idea of fairness. Um, and in this very um, baseline context, it's the idea that burdens are distributed fairly and benefits are distributed fairly, that there isn't one group of people that gets all the benefits and none of the burdens and vice versa. Um, obviously in our society, that is a really hard concept to actually achieve in its ideal form, but that's what we're aiming for in the variety of contexts that we may be applying the idea of justice to. So let's start talking about some different contexts that this, these can apply to. So the field that I work in is human research, and occasionally um, the gaming community engages in human research. There's academic research on how video games are used, how they're developed, how people perceive them. And so the field of human research does overlap with games user research in that way. As I mentioned, the concept of informed consent, that really in my field is how we achieve respect for persons. We give people good information so that they can make a choice. They can say yes or no about whether or not they want to be in the research project. Beneficence, how we honor that in the research field or the human research field is we want to use good science, sound science. We don't want to do crappy science on people that's not going to churn out a result that's real or true, because um, then there's no point in subjecting people to harm or risk. Um, but then we also along the way want to monitor for harms or risks that could happen to people. And so that's how we're ensuring that over time, harms and benefits stay within appropriate levels. And then the idea of justice um, gets translated into ensuring that when we do a research study on people, that we don't include people unfairly. An example of this is we don't just go to a prison where everyone's locked up and can't get away from us and start doing things to people because they can't get away. We don't wanna include people unfairly, but we also don't want to exclude people unfairly. Um, and there's a lot of talk about exclusion of populations in our society right now. And so that could be minority populations, um, indigenous populations, people that speak Spanish instead of English, um, lots of different ways that we want to ensure that we've got equity um, in our inclusion and exclusion practices. So that's what we do in the research field and, it, and it's very similar in others as well. I wanna give you a couple of examples, um, historic examples of how things didn't quite go the way we would ideally hope them to go in the field of human research. So many of you may have heard of the Tuskegee syphilis studies. There's also been discovery of the Guatemalan syphilis studies um, in the early 2000s, um, for which President Obama at the time apologized to the Guatemalan people for. And this, these were studies where, um, at least in Tuskegee, which was here in the United States, um, men with syphilis were observed. We wanted to see what the natural course of syphilis was. But during the course of the study, antibiotics were developed that could treat syphilis. And unfortunately, um, the researchers did not tell the participants that these treatments were available. And they were largely um, a population of African-American black men. Um, and the researchers allowed these black men to experience the suffering of syphilis, which can lead to death if untreated. Um, so some physical harm was done there. In the Guatemalan syphilis studies, we actually infected people with syphilis. Now, these were researchers from the United States, went to Guatemala and treated people much more terribly than we did in the United States, unfortunately. Um, so in these cases, there was a lack of informed consent. Um, with the men here in the United States, 
these black men weren't given the information they needed in order to choose to be in the study or not. There was a lack of informed consent. The same was happening in Guatemala. Um, physical harm was done to these individuals and marginalized populations bore the burden. Um, the, the black community in America was a marginalized population that was treated unfairly in a lot of different situations and that was continued in the study and it also happened in Guatemala as well. Um, many of you may have also heard of Henrietta Lacks, who was a Black woman here in the United States. She was being treated for um, cervical cancer in Baltimore, and um, some of her cervical cells were taken, and they ended up being rather unique and could be cultured into a, an immortal cell line, one that could just go on and on and on living in the lab. And at the time, researchers were having a really hard time getting anybody's cells to be immortalized and live a long time. Um, so when they found Henrietta's cells, they were really excited. And what ended up happening is these cells were used throughout the scientific world for decades and advanced a lot of science. We as a society benefited from Henrietta's, Henrietta's cells that were given. However, she was not asked for informed consent um, when these cells were taken. The benefits to her were not maximized or to her family. We as a society benefited a whole lot from that, but they really didn't, whether you think about that as economic benefit or social benefit. Um, and again, it was a woman from a marginalized population that ended up bearing this burden. Um, and that the fact that she was black and a woman may have contributed to not getting consent from her and not giving burden or not giving benefit back to her and her family. The Tea Room Trade Study um, was a study that was done in the 20th century um, that was looking at the behaviors of men who had sex with men, but were not out. They were not openly gay. Um, in fact, many of these men actually were married to women and had families. And this was going on at a time where it was not very socially accepted to be out as a um, man who has sex with other men. So this researcher was actually going to locations where men would meet up um, to have these encounters. And um, he would basically observe them without their knowledge of what he was doing. And he would follow some of them home. Um, he would know where they lived then. And then he could confront them to ask them more questions about their behaviors and what they did, which would potentially put them at risk um, with their families finding out. Um, so in this case, again, there was a lack of informed consent with this observation that was going on, and it was really socially risky for these men who were being observed to potentially be outed um, at this period of time. And so there is some harm that was, that was experienced here. And then a much more recent example, the Facebook study, which happened in our century presently, um, where researchers were manipulating the feeds of uh, the public, certain individuals, to see if certain ways of manipulating their feeds would make people happier or sadder and see if that was expressed in their social media feed. There was some backlash about this um, because of the lack of informed consent, um, because people felt like they, they should have known about what was going on. They felt like there was psychological and some social harm done because of that. So that's an interesting one that you can look up as well. So I think we're seeing the practicalities of these three ethical principles playing out in human research in our in our lifetimes and in our culture. But I want to also then compare this to how these principles may react in other social situations that we're experiencing right now in the United States. So this example, it's a somber example, um, but it's about abortion access. So this is a topic that's being hotly debated across the country for a wide variety of reasons. And a lot of access to abortion is being restricted across many states. Um, so using our three ethical principles, I just want to talk about, you know, how these apply to this conversation and how, how both sides of the argument are using these three ethical principles to argue their side. So when it comes to respect for persons, we've got people that are arguing we need to respect the woman's right to choose um, and her autonomy. And we've got people arguing that the fetus isn't getting any autonomy and should have some sort of protection based on their lack of of choice. So the idea is, do we choose the respect for the woman or respect for the fetus in this case? With beneficence, um, we end up having the argument that in we want to be able to reduce harm for women 
but by reducing harm for the woman, by allowing her to have access to um, healthy ways to have an abortion, it's obviously increasing harm to the fetus. Um, but we also recognize the opposite is true. If we are reducing harm for the fetus, we might be increasing harm for the woman. And that's what's in conflict. And then justice comes into play in a wide variety of ways in this situation. But one that I think is particularly important is that within some states, there are going to be populations who have increased burden because they have reduced access to abortion and safe abortion services. Um, you can, you've heard the arguments that women who are wealthy, women who are white and in non-marginalized populations are still going to be able to get access to abortion perhaps in neighboring states or in other ways. Um, and that leaves a marginalized population with less access and thus they are bearing the burden and receiving less benefit um, because of these laws and these decisions. Another very common topic for debate um, worldwide is climate change. And these three ethical principles apply to this topic as well. So in terms of respect for persons, um, we may not have access to high quality information depending on who we are about climate change. There's been a lot of misinformation about uh, climate change. There's a lot of, been a lot of denial about it. Um, and there's also, even if people are accessing high quality information, it may be written in a way that they don't understand it. It may be too scientific for them. So we want to make sure that people can get access to that good information to make decisions about how they're going to live their lives. But then once they make that decision, do they have access to the product options that they may want to pursue to help climate change? Can they purchase an electric car? Can they get solar panels on their house? Um, can they purchase green products? that are going to help benefit the planet. And so that's an idea that we need to really think about in terms of respect for persons. Beneficence really comes down to looking at short-term harms, long-term harms, short-term benefits, long-term benefits. So one of the arguments um, against making any changes to, to help the planet is that we are embracing the short-term benefit. We like driving our cars that have gasoline. We we like that we've already got infrastructure in place to get electricity, to get oil and other things, but we recognize that that is at the cost of some long term harm to the climate and to our planet and ecosystems. But then we've got the flip side of that short term harm, where perhaps we harm the economy by taking away certain options like gasoline, oil um, and certain options for energy use um, and wait while we build new infrastructure and put new things in place, but we recognize that there's some long-term benefit to doing that. We are helping the climate, we're helping the planet. Um, but that's where the argument stands, is what people want to sacrifice now versus what they want to get later. And then justice, again, goes back to the idea that there is increased burden and redu reduced benefit for certain populations that have access to fewer resources. So certainly populations in the United States that are more rural or that are not as economically advantaged, may not be able to get access to the products that they wish to have and the resources they wish to have in order to see climate change affected. Um, but we also look at other countries that may maybe don't have the, the, the economic or technology resources that we have in the United States and other perhaps European countries. Um, they feel burdened by having to live up to standards of countries that have more resources than they do. So um, something to think about in terms of justice. So I want to then transition us to the field of games user research. Um, and Lisa is going to take over from here, talking about how these three principles apply to different scenarios um, within the games community and the user research community. But before I turn the time over to her, I want to put three, put an idea into your head about things to consider when we think about these principles, that it may not just be one pinpoint in time. So yes, when you are doing user testing research, that individual who's doing the testing has, needs to be respected. And those three ethical principles can apply to that person in that moment. But that person in that moment then affects the gaming community as a whole potentially. And that person in that moment also 
what they what you learn from that can affect society as a whole. And so we need to think about not just the short term, but the long term impacts that the decisions we make in um, user research, what what they're going to um, apply to later on and and how that impact can propagate. So I will turn the time over to Lisa. All right, so for this section of the presentation, we're gonna go through a few real world examples um, from the, the gaming universe and just from um, the gaming community in general that kind of go over these concepts that we've already talked about and just kind of relate these, um, these topics related to research ethics to the world of gaming. Um, the first thing we kind of want to talk about is just the idea of informed consent. And we've gone over a little bit of how that touches the ethical principle of respect for persons. Um, it touches other things as well. And what you'll find as we go through this is a lot of these concepts as we move through the real world space and apply them, they touch on all three of those concepts pretty frequently. Um, so it's just interesting to talk about it a little bit. And I'd love for you to think about these things as we're discussing it and just kind of think about how, how the, the life experience you have with um, games research, game development, game testing, how it can um, apply to all of these principles and how you can think about them as you are um, doing your daily jobs. Um, so this first one, the idea of informed consent, um, this usually comes into play in the gaming world with the idea of testing and user research. Um, a lot of times when we have a new game under development, uh, there are aspects of it that need real people to test them out to make sure they work, um, to also get people's opinions of the game itself to make sure that it is something that people would want to buy, want to play. Uh, and, you know, sometimes that feedback comes back in the form of comments. Sometimes it comes back in the form of playability. Um, sometimes it's data that's collected as people are playing a beta that's been released. The question that we would like to pose is, as you are releasing a beta for testing, as you are recruiting people to help with testing, are you obtaining meaningful consent from these people? Um, do these testers understand what you are using this information for, what they're helping with, and do they understand that they're being recorded or that data is being collected about them? Do they know that their interactions are gonna be recorded? Do they understand the concept of whether or not they are in a public space or a private space when you're doing the testing? So there is a, there is a concept in research ethics related to observability and whether or not people understand that they're being observed for research. So just like the tea room trade study that we talked about before, you know, when people are engaging in certain aspects of their lives, sometimes they expect that something would be considered private when it actually isn't. So it's important that when we're doing research on people, if there is a possibility that they could expect something to be private um, or just not public, that uh, we make sure that they understand that they're being observed in that situation. Um, one thing that comes up a lot in the gaming community, especially when it comes to research or when it comes to recording people for research, um, is the idea of the gamer tag being an identifier. Uh, in medical research, we think a lot of, you know, medical records or your name or your address or your phone number or your email address being an identifiable uh, data point that researchers would collect that could then, you know, link you to the fact that you were in the study. One thing that is pretty unique to the gaming community that is definitely a considered a, an a identifier is a person's gamer tag. So if you are running a test and there's a chat window on the side and every time they add something to the chat, their gamer tag is linked to that comment and all of that's being recorded and saved for your research, it's important to let these folks know you're being recorded and your responses are identifiable. Um, the other thing that comes up quite a bit with playtesting is compensation. Now, we see this a lot with, um, with testing groups where they say, volunteer to come and test, and you're going to get all this cool swag. We're going to give you, you know, game merchandise. We're going to give you a gift card for the Xbox store. We're going to give you compensation for your time, and this is what you're going to get to come and test for us. Um, 
this concept of compensation is actually something that uh, is an important point in research ethics because, well, for multiple reasons, but one of the big things that we need to consider is whether the amount or the type of compensation is considered coercive. And this is this can be a pretty complicated issue to break down because whether you know a hundred dollars is coercive can depend a lot on the person, their economic um, situation. Uh, you know, if I have if I'm short a hundred bucks on my bills that month, I might be really motivated to be in your study because of the fact that you are um, offering that money to me. So, you know, maybe that would motivate me to be in your research more than otherwise. Another thing that we'd like to think about with this is whether or not the participants in your testing groups understand the possible risks involved in participating. Now, this can vary depending on the game. It can vary depending on how much time you're asking them to devote to testing or the situation involved with the testing. Uh, for example, with VR testing, we find that some of the risks are actually physical. Uh, if you're testing VR games with people who have balance issues or uh, have other physical uh, ailments that might limit their ability to participate in VR research, they can literally fall while they're you know, participating in your research test. Um, sometimes the risks are more psychological, uh, and we'll talk about that a little bit uh, later on, but, you know, something to consider is if you are um, testing your game in a population that is more conservative, and perhaps the game is a little more explicit, perhaps testing your game might expose them to things that they're uncomfortable with. So some of these things to consider and making sure that as we consider all of these things, we are informing the participants who are volunteering for our user test groups um, before they sign up to do it. So now we're going to shift into some examples from just games that are out there right now and just kind of talking about some of these concepts and how they might apply to real world examples of games. Uh, one of my favorite game series is the Mass Effect game series from BioWare. There's three games involved there. And as most people who are uh, fans of the series know, it was originally released uh, back in the early 20 teens. Um, and there was a lot of statistics that were collected at the time about how they played, how people played. The game is very heavy on user decisions. There are a lot of decisions that the user can make. And so there was a lot of fascinating data collected about the decisions that people decided to make in the game. Um, when the original release happened, uh, they collected statistics on one of the most interesting uh, aspects of the choice you can make in the game, which is what gender character do you choose to play as? Uh, you could play as Shepard, who is the male version of the character, who is the canon and, and uh, default version of the character, or you could choose to play as the female version of Shepard as well. Um, and when the original uh, data was collected on the Mass Effect series, BioWare let everyone know that 82% of Mass Effect players ran as the male version of the hero the first time. Uh, fast forward several years, and just this past year, we had a release, a re-release of this video game series, all remastered and all beautiful with all of our new 4K uh, technology. And the so the Legendary Edition came out and it actually introduced a whole new generation of players to the Mass Effect series. It was fascinating to watch on Twitter the conversations with Gen Z players who had never even heard of this series before, who were playing it for the first time. Well, BioWare collected this data again, and in July of 2021, they let everyone know that double the amount of players who chose um, their the gender of their character chose to play as Fem Shep this time around. So it was an interesting shift in the way that people play these games and kind of the, the choices that they chose to make. So I wanna kind of touch back to something that we asked you before, which was just to consider the impact of some of the games that we are developing for the public. And as we dive into some more of these examples, let's just think about this for a little bit that representation in these games really does matter. And these concepts of respect for persons and beneficence and justice really touch on 
are the people who play the games being adequately represented? And does the impact that your game has in those aspects, is it being felt and is it being considered? Um, we all know that games are quickly competing and outpacing with the movie industry and in some cases um, are actually more profitable than the movie industry at this point. So it's really important for us to consider what influence these games have um, on these traditionally underrepresented groups and do the games matter? And if they do, what's our responsibility to make sure that these groups are adequately represented? Do you have an opportunity here to have a positive societal impact with your art? And how do you balance that with profitability and making sure that people want to buy your game? Just some things to consider. Hey, Anne, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I think, you know, we could, we could argue that profitability is a, is a common morality in, in the games uh, field um, because you're trying to make money. Um, but there, there are far more concepts um, that games that matter to the gaming community. And I think over the last few years, if not, you know, decade, we have seen the public say they want their voice to matter. And so it's up to us in these industries, research, games, to decide, are we going to hear that voice? Are we going to hear that cry from the community saying, we want our voice to matter? And are we going to respond by honoring that voice? So it's it's a it's a deep question, and we need to figure out how we respond to that outcry. Yeah, definitely. And I think the idea that the gaming community is this small fringe community that is, you know, just not a lot of people and really doesn't matter in and of itself is quickly evaporating. That idea is not true and we know that now so many people play games so many people from different walks of life different genders all kinds of people are represented in this community so you know the impact is real and it's it's definitely time to consider the ethical implications involved in um, what that means so one of the um examples that matters a lot to me as a woman who is also a gamer uh metroid so this game this game really just kind of shook up a lot of people because the, you play the entire game and then it's revealed at the end that Seamus is female. And the fact that it was so impactful and that it shocked so many people really actually spoke to the fact that it shouldn't have. Um, you know, it really kind of woke people up to the fact that why does it shock us that this, you know, this really impactful character who is really cool and, you know, compromising, uncompromisingly badass character, as this quote says, uh, was female. Like, why did that shock us? Um, so it started a lot of good conversations um, about, representation of women in these games. So I'm just going to read this quote really quickly from Audrey Jake from IGN. It says, I'll never forget when I first played the original Metroid for Nintendo. Not only was it was the game itself incredible and like nothing I'd ever experienced before, but the revelation at the end took me completely off guard. That cool, calculated, uncompromisingly badass character I'd been kicking alien butt as had actually been of the female persuasion. Was it possible? So such an interesting example of uh, the representation of different identities and different genders in games and just kind of touching on this a little bit. Um, I think we can think of several other examples. Um, the Femship example is an interesting one, but there's lots in games. And I think we've seen it, especially in the past five years, this thought of how are we portraying women in games and how are we uh, making sure that this idea of equity uh, is being represented. Um, now with that comes this idea of are women also being included in the development and the design and the testing phases of games? Uh, when you go to test these games, are you including women in the testing groups? Uh, are you asking them how for their feedback on how a character is dressed, on how a character is portrayed, on some of the scripts and the lines that they're asked to say? Do you understand as a developer um, the users preferences and their interests if if almost half of your audience is female are you including that proportion of people in the feedback stage of your game development 
And with that comes, comes the idea of including this group fairly, right? So, so are they being asked to um, feel the burdens as well as the benefits of the game development uh, stage of things? Are you asking them to shoulder some of the burden of testing these games? Um, and, you know, that's something from an equity standpoint that is important. Women want to help with this kind of thing and want these opportunities as well. So um, that's something to, to think about for sure. And then one thing that uh, we'll, we'll talk about a little bit here is um, how does access to the internet or the ability to afford an expensive gaming platform or fast internet speed or, or you know, a PC versus a console. How do these things affect uh, the equity of the user experience and the industry? Uh, can you crowdsource your user test group and expect your users to be all, you know, the, the demographics that you're looking for? Um, or are you just going to get people who can afford broadband and, you know, a, a, a PS5? Like, are you going to get um, the, the diversity that you're looking for? And are you going to be able to make sure that you are appealing to the largest number of people and representing all these people uh, if you don't ask them, do you have access to this speed of internet when you go and crowdsource your users? It's an interesting thing to think about. Um, another group that we sometimes think about more and more is LGBTQ plus groups and, and representation in games. And I think for those of us who have gamed for a long time, we know that this group sometimes has actually been ridiculed in games and has been used as um, something to make fun of in games or has been portrayed in humorous ways before. So the idea that representation matters and that it matters that these people can be considered heroes, but also just happen to be gay is something that is a, a relatively new concept, but also something that's probably long overdue. Um, this example is my favorite. So the Overwatch community is pretty amazing and pretty diverse. Um, but this game has been out for a couple of years now. And one thing that they enjoy doing is giving the backstories of their characters over time. So they introduce the game, people love it, people love the characters, and then they start releasing the shorts uh, online that tell you a little bit more about these folks. Um, we've known for quite a while that Tracer was a member of the LGBTQ community, um, but it was more recently uh, revealed that Soldier 76, who is very like cliche, you know, gamer, like straightforward, badass kind of character, um, he's gay. And they revealed it recently. And it was interesting to see um, the vast majority, I feel, of Overwatch uh, players were like, oh, okay, and very accepting of that. But there's always a group that's like, what? Like, how is that possible? So it's interesting to kind of see that, that conversation going and how Blizzard has just been willing to just go, yep, this is what it is. And this character who is great, who is a positive character, who is a force in this game, yeah, he just also happens to be gay. So here's this quote from Brandon Zachary at CBR.com, who says, Blizzard is forcing players who may have been hesitant to embrace LGBTQ characters to realize they're as valuable as anyone else in the game, and not just as romantic options. They don't have to be over-the-top stereotypes or killed in the first minute. They can be the characters we identify with, play as, and learn to love, the same as any other character. Which again, is something that probably shouldn't be such an exciting concept, but it is. And this is something that the gaming community is dealing with and is embracing, and it's quite interesting. So the idea that a game could have this kind of social impact and could have such a positive impact on a group of people that is struggling right now for equality and fairness in society, and that a game could help with that, that is a very cool thing. And did you have anything to add? Yeah, I, I do, you know, want to applaud, you know, games such as this and companies such as this that are, you know, kind of pushing the envelope and, and exposing, you know, the, the diversity that I think needs to be there. Um, and I think in terms of the ethical context, it's just important to realize, you know, we, I think we would all recognize that the principle of justice is being, you know, 
pushed at here and, it, and in a good way. Um, but are we realizing why? Are we realizing that it's because of the benefits and burdens, um, that beneficence concept? Um, are we realizing that there's that autonomy piece? We talk about, or this quote talks about choice. We get to choose to be these characters and then learn to love them um, and get to gain information about them. You know, so all three principles are really tying in here as we bolster justice, social justice. Um, I think it's fantastic. Yeah, it's very exciting. This And this is definitely not the only game that is starting to wade into these waters. And it's been very, very cool to see. Um, so let's talk about this just briefly, just give you some questions to think about in relation to this concept of benefit, beneficence, um, reducing harms and maximizing benefits for everyone. But like we said, it touches different things as well. So the concept of justice, equality, um, but also informed consent and testing, like making sure people understand what they're getting involved in and asking them the questions that might touch on some of these things so you can get good feedback. Um, just thinking about this, what is a game designer's responsibility to better the world and promote social justice through their game? And how do you balance that ethical challenge with maintaining profitability? You got to be able to still sell the game. Um, so, you know, how do you reach a balance there? And how do you how do you make a positive social impact without going over the top and putting people off so they don't buy the game? How do video games affect cultural and social development in the youth populations? So this is something that I think we're all familiar with in the gaming community is there is always this debate that pops up from time to time about, well, the violence in video games causes violence in society. We now know after quite a bit of research that that is not really true. And um, so now we see more research coming out that is focusing more on some of the more positive aspects of gaming. And so we have, um, we have some information now with several studies that we're, we can share with you uh, at the end that, um, so like developmental and social psychology, especially are looking at um, the possible positive outcomes of gaming and research, um, which include fostering initiative, creativity, cooperation, and, you know, strategic problem solving. Uh, we're also seeing, at least uh, with human subjects research in the medical community related to this, um, people are using VR and are using things like the Wii, where you have interactive gaming. Uh, they're using it for physical therapy and to help people break out of depression and things like that. So it's really refreshing to see some of the more positive outcomes related to gaming and um, something to definitely keep in mind as you're developing a game. Uh, how can you have that positive impact on, on society? Lisa, could I add one thing to that? Sure. Mm -hmm. So as you were, you know, describing this, I, I think about, you know, in the game, in the user testing phase, are we actually, are you actually um, measuring or starting to measure the potential impact your game is going to have from the beginning in the testing phase instead of just after release as people get reactionary? There's this idea that we could be more proactive um, to measure and understand our impact and evaluate our potential impact before release so that we're being proactive instead of reactionary um, when the game is actually released. So in the, in the user testing space, you know, I would certainly encourage people to think about not just throwing a, a black or a gay or a female character in, you know, just because, but the idea being is that going to have the kind of impact you want? Are people's perceptions going to um, understand that well? And, and can you be measuring that perception before you release the game um, so that you understand better um, how to, what the, what the reaction is after the game has been released? So. Yeah. Well, and keeping those things in mind from the beginning of the game development phase is the key because then you can collect good data throughout the course of your game and 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 improve upon it with the next one and uh, you know imagine the kind of positive outcomes we could start to see uh, in research related to the gaming community that could help you know society's view of of the impact that games do have
Um, one of the hot button things that always, again, comes up with the world of video games is violence in games, sexual content in games. And as we think about these kinds of things, we know we have a rating system here in the United States related to game releases. There's similar things in other countries. Um, so Gears of War is an awesome game series but it's very violent. And um, so it's interesting as Gears of War has released several uh, games over the years in this series, uh, usually there will be some talk in the media about, oh, here's another violent video game and do we really need this and what's it gonna do to our kids? Um, so this was an interesting article um, from bbc.com. So over in, in the UK, they, they talked about this idea of violent content and the creator of Gears of War went and talked to them about it. And so here it says, the creator of the su successful Xbox video game series, Gears of War, has defended the use of violence in his video games. He says, it's funny because the industry sometimes comes under fire from watchdog groups with regards to this sort of violence. His comments come during a week when a case was held in the U.S. Supreme Court over whether children should be stopped from buy buying violent video games. Uh, this creator pointed out that the level of violence in their video games is carefully monitored and vetted. So he says, we have an internal moral compass where we will decide, no, that's a little bit too much, or we need to cut the violence back a little bit, he explained. So that's an interesting take on the way they kind of self-calibrate violence. And the interesting part of this to me is he's defending the violent levels in his video games and says, oh, we do a good job of self-monitoring this. But the whole point that he's being interviewed of is society is going, uh, but it's a little too violent for us. So this idea of peer monitoring and getting some outside uh, opinions about your game and about how violent it is or about the level of sexual content or getting just some feedback from the general public along the way while you're developing and testing these games can be very beneficial to helping you avoid some of these uncomfortable situations after the game is released. And I think this idea of some sort of peer review or monitoring can really help the industry a lot. Um, you know, it doesn't necessarily have to transition uh, translate into, you know, completely neutering the game of all the things that make it cool and make the gaming community want to play your game. Because if you remove the chainsaw gun from Gears of War, it just ain't Gears of War anymore. Um, you can't do that. But but getting some of this uh, feedback from some of these folks about who don't play games and who may, you know, see this and have an opinion about it, if you get that opinion ahead of time, that could really help, you know, get you some good feedback and some positive uh, information ahead of time that could help you calibrate some of these things. And the interesting thing about Gears of War is it has a setting in it where you can turn the blood on and off. And that is something that really helped a lot of parents go, okay, I guess. <laughs> so, um, so that's an interesting thing that has really kind of, you know, come into some of these games where it's like, yeah, you can, you can choose how much blood you want to see in this game. Um, so some more things to consider uh, related to this whole concept. Um, are societal values considered when games are designed and tested? And this is important uh, related to the idea of justice and fairness, but it's also important related to the idea of informed consent with your user test groups, because if you are truly informing them of the risks involved in the research, those risks need to be calibrated based on societal norms for that group. So if you are testing these games in the United States versus Europe or Japan or South Korea, they're going to have different tolerances for violence, for sexual content, for all of these things. And so if you are sourcing your user test group from, from say, Japan, uh, but also from the United States, the folks in the United States might be a little more uncomfortable with the sexual content than the folks in Japan are. Like that's just differences in societal norms related to cultural standards. So making sure they understand what they're signing up for before you expose them to things is important. Um, and considering their values is something that's important as well. And, you know, this is something that you can inform people to a certain degree, but then it's also important to ask them and just say, you know, this is interesting information for us to have. Um, there's a quote on here that um, is from an article related to game standards. 
It says, while America tends to get much more concerned over sex or a flash of pants than it does about violence, the trend is reversed in the rest of Europe, where they're a lot less prudish about sex, but a lot more concerned about graphic violence. Japan, meanwhile, is sometimes a bit iffy about blood, but is A-OK -okay with scantily clad teenage girls. And as such, many games often end up with female characters having their ages hiked up a few years for their eventual release in the West. So these are societal differences that are important not only to inform the public about, but also to inform your testing group about when you're developing the game. Uh, did you ha have anything to add there? The one example I always refer to when this idea of risk tolerances is, um, we're all different, obviously, of what we'll tolerate in terms of risk to ourselves. My husband is a rock climber. He climbs very tall things. Um, his idea of risk is very different than mine when it comes to that physical risk. Um, and so it's important to recognize he's not a bad person for wanting to take that risk. I'm not a bad person for wanting to take that risk. But acknowledging that our risk tolerances are different does help us navigate the world better. And so, as you said, focusing back on informed consent and letting people understand and make a choice um, and not exposing them to things that they don't want to tolerate. Yeah, and so there's another thing that's kind of something, and I don't know the answer to this question, but it's something interesting just to think about. Um, so one of the biggest problems with some of these um, studies that we talked about at the beginning of this presentation um, was that people hid the fact that they were doing research from the public. And so when people found out the research was being done, there was a degradation of trust in the research community. And so we find that one of the harms of hiding research like this from the public is that if you hide it and they find out about it, they don't trust the researchers anymore. Um, so it's important not only, you know, for the sake of future research to make sure that people are well informed about it, but the other thing we find is that if you just ask up front, if you just ask people and inform people that things are happening, most of the time they're okay with it. And most of the time they're willing to participate in the research. Um, but you have to ask up front and you have to be open about it. So the idea in some of these games that, you know, how do you balance the idea of some of the like shocking moments that people talk about and, oh my heck, that happened in this game um, versus informing people Dear parents, there's a scene in this game where XYZ happens and you just need to know about this. Um, you know, how do you balance those things to make sure that the public is well informed about, you know, what they're buying and what, they're, um, what their children are exposed to or maybe what they're exposing themselves to? Just something interesting. Okay. So one more example that I want to touch on is the idea of justice and fairness. Uh, one of the examples that uh, it, it's something that we encounter every day now in the gaming community, it seems like, but it, it's the idea of DLCs and microtransactions. And the idea that some of these games advertise as free to play and then once you get into them, you are asked to dump money into upgrades and, you know, all of these microtransactions that can really add up over time. And what we see over time is some of these games that advertise as free to play initially are some of the more profitable games in the industry. Um, so is that fair? And is that something that uh, perhaps introduces inequity in the gaming community? If I'm somebody who literally can't afford that, you know, 10 bucks for a game upgrade uh, or for a new gun that is, you know, what I need to, you know, win this map or something like that, um, does that mean that I am put at a disadvantage because I don't have extra money to burn on this game? So something to think about with that. Um, and I have a couple of quotes here just really Related to a couple of games where this has been quite hotly debated recently. So Assassin's Creed, Creed Valhalla is taking a lot of flack right now because some of the DLCs are as expensive as the base game itself. So you're basically buying the game again to play the extra content. Um, and there's a lot of debate going on about, is that okay? And should I be expected to pay for the game over again just to play this new stuff that's been added? 
Um, another one is Destiny. So Destiny is taking a lot of criticism right now because the microtransactions are ramping up. So when the games were first released, it wasn't that big of a deal, but now it is. And so if you want new emotes, if you want this new ornament for a gun, or you want a new finisher for your character, you got to pay for it. And so there are a lot of um, questions swirling right now about, is that okay? And, you know, should I have to pay for more content for a game? that I already bought. So now we're going to talk about some key takeaways, um, and I'm going to switch it back over to Anne to go ahead and introduce this, and then uh, we'll wrap up. All right. So some things. The, these Now that you've heard this presentation, all of this is going to be obvious to you is what we would recommend to you. But here we are. The first one, consider informed consent. Um, it may not be required by regulation or by law within the gaming industry, but for transparency and trust purposes, so people really can truly understand what, what you're asking them to do, um, informed consent is a big tool in that. Um, and so with all the things we've talked about today, helping people understand what you're actually asking them to do is important. We talked a lot about equity and inequity today um, and you know where do we fall in our consciences to address this as part of the gaming community and so you should consider gender and social equity issues when you're doing the testing and development whether that's including testers that are of different genders um, different um, ethnic backgrounds different potentially languages spoken um, different um, sexuality identities that really can matter in the initial development and then have an impact later on. Consider the risks beyond the risks of the moment, which we've absolutely talked about. So the things that we do in that testing phase can have an impact down the road. And um, maybe we're trying to do that on purpose. And maybe we need to take a greater look at at what we're doing again early on and be proactive in those testing phases so that we're actually better cognizant of the impact that we're going to have um, or maybe that we're intending to have. And then lastly, as Lisa eloquently mentioned, consider how to incorporate independent peer review or monitoring into your process. Um, having someone just come and look at your operations, look what you're doing, check out, you know, how the users are doing the testing and getting their feedback on what your process is can be valuable. Um, constructive feedback, constructive criticism in, in safe ways um, that help us feel like we can learn without being criticized or shut down are very valuable. And do we feel comfortable with our practices enough to let somebody else see them? I think that's really the key there. Do we feel comfortable enough with what we're doing to be transparent? And if you do, then you would be open to this idea of having somebody else come and look at the books and look at the way things are going on. That's why, you know, accountants get audited um, because money matters in that way. Um, but do, does the user testing experience matter in that way too? And I, I think we've argued successfully that it does. Lisa, any further comments on these recommendations? No, other than just to encourage the thought process. And, you know, it's sometimes it's difficult to balance the idea of profitability in games and just making the money and getting the game out and, and also giving consideration to some of these more weighty issues. But I think that the big takeaway here is the gaming industry is huge. It has a huge impact on just about every aspect of society that people talk about these days. And it's definitely time for the gaming industry to really uh, consider that impact and think about what it wants to do with the power that it's gained. Um, and I think it's exciting and I think it's very cool. Excellent. Well, we appreciate everybody joining us today for this session. Um, feel free to reach out to Lisa and I professionally if you have any questions or just want to talk about this some more. Um, but we're really grateful for the opportunity that we could share this knowledge with you and we hope you enjoy the rest of the conference.